Thank you very much for coming along to the talk today. Um, the secret to successful adoption of developer platforms. Um, to give you an idea, first of all, who I am, um, my name is Matt Cobby. I'm currently working for Deloitte, but I have a history of uh, changing from team to team, um, being a developer that would arrive in a new team, look at the situation there and go, I need to improve the way we work. Um, I need to work out how we do these things a little bit better. Um, so I've been doing that for quite some time. Um, I've been doing transformation work for over 18 years. And most recently before Deloitte, I've been working in uh, National Australia Bank, where we were on a seven year journey there to completely transform the bank from a, uh, a place that was very, very um, old school into something that's been very cut engaged and ahead of the curve. If you want to follow up afterwards, um, you have my Twitter handle there, which I'm still using, and LinkedIn details there as well. So I guess the question is, what are we what are we interested in developing platforms for? Um, you, we've seen in the, the, the previous keynote, and it's all about the evolutionary path for products. Um, there's often a the viewpoint that, you know, by the time you invent a strategy and by the time you get to execute on it, it's already behind the curve. So one of the key differentials you can have um, as a company is that, uh, you know, against um, competition is one to be continually evolving. So here we, we fully embrace um, the, the concepts behind the world of maps. And we talk about, you know, how do we keep reinventing our, um, our product faster and faster and do it in a way which means that because we're reinventing so fast, there's no way that the competition can keep up with us as well. And we're very much in an age where technology teams are, are very much the, the beating heart of so many businesses. Uh, so they're, the, they're no longer seen as purely cost centers and they're very much more about enabling that innovation. So the developer platforms are kind of a key part to this. Um, with that pressure to transform, there's a lot to do. Um, I, I started developing 20 to 30 years ago where things were quite simple. Um, and there, weren't, there wasn't much to do. There was some code, you compile it, you write it, you run it, and that's pretty much what we did. But these days, there's a lot more we can do. We can work at global scales, um, at doing things which would never have been possible um, a short time ago. But it does come with a lot of increased complexity. Now, within a large organization, you have a lot to work your way, work your way through. Um, you often you, to talk to a developer and you say, oh, I'm a full stack developer and you kind of work out what that stack means. And typically, it's the first few layers on this, on this um, diagram here. But if you want to build a system and run a system, particularly in a complex environment, um, I come from uh, banking, so you know, running a, a system in the bank is quite complicated. There's lots we have to do. Um, there's lots of governance we have to do. There's lots of compliance we've got to do. There's lots of security checks we have to look at, and there's financials and operations and regulations that we have to comply with. Now, all of that is what we have to do to actually deliver any good customer value. You know, you know your job there is to think about um, what is the customer experience? What are the customer needs? What is what is what are we building for them? But a lot of technology teams spend a lot of the time below the line, um, working on the non-differentiating parts of the work. They're all entirely necessary. We need these things to run our big complex systems, but they don't add in themselves direct value to the customer. So one of the things we're trying to be looking at is the use of these um, internal developer platforms. Um, I've been building those for about seven years. Um, we're starting to see that evolutionary change. Um, we've got the you know backstage and there's a few other commercial companies who are now turning these things into products. So typically your internal platforms are always custom built and now they're turning into products. But the question is, how do you make these things work? Um, they're incredibly expensive. Um, they're hard to build. They're very suited just to your context, typically your sets of regulations. Um, and so you've got to make sure that these things get, can work. And to just to, you know, to reinforce the thing that what we're doing is that they sit in between your industry standard platforms, and whether that's your data center, your cloud platform, um, I sit between that and what you're building as an experience. And it's you find this comes out quite often now, and you've got it in the state of DevOps reports over the last couple of years, where the the most highly evolved organisations are using these things because they're using them as an accelerator for the team, so they have to spend less time thinking about the the mundane aspects of of their work and thinking about how they can add value to that digital experience for the, the users what the users needs and what do they want 
typically in the bank, you'll find a lot of people will work on, they'll spend a lot of time below the line working on the governance and the regulations and the, the weeks and weeks of um, manual compliance it takes to launch a service into production. But these things are often fairly bespoke. Um, and this, as I said before, they take up a, quite a significant investment. So what we're going to do today is take you through kind of the evolutionary journey of an internal developer platform and how Innersource can help along the way. Some of the problems that the, the, the platform team will encounter or typically will encounter and some of the way that Innersource can help um, as well. So when you start launching the platform, there's a lot of investment up front. Um, there's lots that goes around the platform. You know, there's there's a lot of different things that you have to think about. Um, you probably have a platform product owner. You've got a backlog of work to work your way through, and you've got a team to do the work. Now, ideally, that platform team and the product owner should be um, out among those teams and um, understanding what what the problems are, talking to them, um, sharing prototypes with them, and understanding what value they need from the, the platform. And typically, when you launch one of these. Everyone's very excited. Um, it's all good. You know, you, you turn up a, a team and promise to make their life easier. And who's not going to say, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to have my life to be a little bit easier. So you have the teams, you know, the enthusiasts to get on board. They've got ideas to throw into the roadmap as well. Um, they want to get boarded, and they're already coming at you with um, new ideas for features as well. So to, you know, to set up a platform, there's a lot there. Um, ideally, probably when you launch, you're not going to have all these capabilities in place at the um, first point. Um, if you are, the chances are you've over-engineered, but you'll, you'll work your way through it and um, add these capabilities as they go. But then the, the platform launches, and then teams start asking for things. And everything's good at this point. You know, we've, we've got a squad that wants a new feature there. There's another squad there that wants to add a, a new field to an API. They want to make a change to an existing API. Um, so they can perhaps use it in a different way for an, an experiment they want to run. You've got uh, really good onboarding. You've got 20 squads that want to come aboard immediately. And you know, you've got a team on the top right. We've got the ones which are you know, um, more innovative. We've got the ones which are perhaps looking to build a new tech. Um, they've discovered the latest thing that they want to use, and they want to build that into the platform. Then there's the team, um, which always needs um, higher service levels than you've got. Um, the matter of times we've have been in situations where you're running a high availability service, but the tooling that you're relying on isn't high avail availability. But it creates these tensions within organizations. But at this point, everyone's still happy. You know, the platform team is still happy, and the users are still happy. But being a large organization, there's a lot of hubris involved and a lot of requirements and things come through. Um, and you get all these different forces that now start to act upon the platform team, the platform product owners. Um, if you ever worked in a large company, you'll know, you know what these, these um, conversations are like. Risk will be talking to you about saying, we've got a new set of regulations that you have to comply with. Um, finance is always asking why you're spending so much on your infrastructure. Um, security, um, I said, this is great. Um, we love this because we can put guardrails around the application teams and we can see what they want, but we need to have full auditing of what developers are doing into our um, into our systems this quarter. Then architecture come along and go, this is great, but we've decided to change our target site architecture. We're no, no longer going to use VMs and everything's going to be containers, or something similar. And then the CTO um, that always has an idea on something else you need to do, and there's some external pressure that they say, these are the projects that we've got to finish. So this sets the alarm bells um, ringing on the platform team. Um, the backlog starts getting under a bit of pressure. There's extra work coming in. And you know, you've got a situation where the platform team have got the external users of the system and the internal pressures of the organization. We're starting to see a little bit of friction there. And then by the time the users are asking for features on top, everything starts to grind to a halt. Um, you get this thing called backlog coupling. Um, the different teams can't progress something because the back, they're waiting on, the, on an issue from a feature and a backlog in another team. Um, you can, of these are kind of conversations you generally will work with. You know. The team that needs a new feature, but we can't do it the next financial year. Um, somebody wants to make a modification, the platform team, no way. Who's going to support it? I can't be on the hook for your change. The onboarding has to wait for a few months. Um, this new tech, um, it may be great. It may be the latest thing, but it's not in the roadmap. It's not part of the architectural um, target state. Um, and you can't make the availability um, that the teams need. So we've now got the situation where this platform team was meant to help but now starting to block all these delivery teams. 
And it's quite a common thing um, when these teams start um, that organizations will often create, they say they're creating a platform, but what they're really doing is creating a service team. And that service team has um, constraints, it has restrictions, it isn't able to service users at the speed that they'd like as well. So this is where InSource, for me, helps um, unlock some of the potential of these platforms and the trouble that they get into inside of organizations. Um, they really give that point of, you know, the voice of the customer. Um, by incorporating InSource into the operating model for your platform, you suddenly can remove some of these frictions. You create some of the tensions. You stop being a team that says no to your users. Um, you need to make sure you've got a good product roadmap. Um, you look for a good developer experience as well. Um, looking for you know, helping to drive some of the platform reuse, and the source can help with this. And we'll go through some examples in a moment. Uh, good documentation is, is vital for onboarding and feature collaboration, along with the warranty support or new features going into production as well. So on the right is the kind of definition of inner source I use um, often when I'm talking to teams. You know, it's not just bits of code we're working with; it's knowledge and skills and code across teams um, using those open source collaboration techniques. So how can the source help? Well, that team that wants a new feature, they can go develop the feature. You know, if they have the conversation with the product owner, they look at the backlog, the platform's got the good common developer experience so that any other developer can pick up their environment and develop new components. And it might be that we've got a bit of elastic capacity within the organization. You know, if we've got this common developer experience through the use of inner source across the developer platform, we can have multiple squads or people who are on, on perhaps um, not a full utilization, can they can all swarm and work on this feature. And because it's aligned with the product roadmap in this instance, um, the roadmap's green, the components are green, and we can start to move ahead and everyone starts to be happy again. For different situations, we've got around um, the documentation, we can find onboarding, other teams can help with the product documentation as well. And they can work through that. And it's quite easy and teams can then onboard themselves. And that's a common thing to have the documentation available and open to all. For that team that wants to help create the new API or perhaps change the new API, it can create some reuse. The product owners are happy because it gets reused in their API rather than team developing a whole new one. And the other squad on the other side can help there as well. And this with this one, you know, comes the idea of uh, additional support. You know, we can work on the integration together and that product team can stop being the blocker. Um, with the new tech, this is where the relationship gets a little different, you know. Um, it could be that the squad there will say, well, we'll we'll take a fork of the code, we'll develop our new component of this, we'll build these accelerators there, we'll incorporate this new technology. And the platform owner can go, that's okay. You've got it contained within your context and that's all right. We won't support it at this point, but we'll put it on the roadmap for future usage as well. Again, in the source, providing that, that um, reduction of um, friction in an organization. And finally, with the aspect of sometimes it's around funding as well for the availability of the service. Uh, sometimes it's, there, are, there are problems which can't, can't be resolved. But using techniques such as an RFC, a request for comments, um, using very much an, in a sort of style of collaboration, we can have these discussions and open and we can work around what are the other things that we could do to help resolve this problem. So just to bring this back into the, the patterns and the, some of the conversations earlier around, you know, we have the patterns working group. Um, these are some of the patterns I've used in this demonstration here about how inner source can help remove the friction of an organization and uh, help the ad successful adoption. But they're there on the patterns on the inner source group, and I would encourage you to go use it as well. And thank you very much for your time.